Hello everyone. We're gonna spend some time talking about how to lead a data-driven digital transformation. And this is what every leader should know. I'm Ray Wong with Constellation Research, and I wanna start with this fact. 61% of the Fortune 500 have been gone. They've been merged, acquired, gone bankrupt since 2000. Think about that. That is the pace of change that has been happening since 2000. These are business models. These are organizations transforming and in the process, taking out the competitors. I want you to take some time and follow along. What do you think is the hottest performing stock since 2000? I'm gonna put some names up here. You can guess, yell out loud, tell me what you're hearing. All right, the fangs, I'll throw another one just for fun. Are you guys ready? I'm gonna do the countdown. Five, four, three, two, are you ready? Here it is. Domino's Pizza, that is the number one top performing stock since 2010. Now, this is an incredible story of transformation. Domino's actually won the battle for transformation. Think about it. How often do you order the pizza a week, right? And when you order that pizza, think about it. What happens? You're on the app and at 4 p.m., suddenly a notification shows up and says, would you like a pizza? And most people say yes. Now behind the back end of what is happening is amount of data transformation, amount of data that's actually happening and a massive digital transformation effort, right? Once you order that pizza, it sets off everything, inventory, supply chains, it sets off the kitchen. The kitchen knows that they gotta get this pizza in and delivered by 30 minutes or less, right? And you get a status. You know that the pizza order has been taken. You know that the pizza's in the oven. You know the pizza is 10 minutes away, five minutes away, and two minutes away from your door. And in fact, you never had to pull out any cash. You can pay everything on the app. That is what we're talking about. And in fact, if you even try, you can actually take a picture of the pizza. It goes into an AI ML engine and they test the quality of that pizza. That is what we're talking about. That is a major transformation that occurs. Now, we can say Domino's won the digital transformation war, but did it really win. And actually there's something that's actually happening, right? Because we are seeing that this is the foundation of every single digital business, the ability to bring data, the ability to bring these inputs, the able to put all this signal intelligence in play. And the goal here, it's about getting to precision decisions. That decision velocity becomes a very important piece. Now, why are precision decisions so hard? How do we get there? How do we become successful? Well, there's a reason these are hard, right? It's really because we've got so many data sources. There's data all over the place. It's sitting in a mainframe. It's sitting over on an app. It's in an IoT device. It's sitting on three other clouds. And that makes it very hard. Now, that also brings us to the point that we have complex data environments. These environments are crazy, right? And there's also all these privacy rules and requirements and data residency, and suddenly data is encrypted, some data is not encrypted, and we gotta pull all this together. And then of course, there's a lot of external data sources too. We're not just talking about the stuff that's in your control. We're talking about weather feeds. We're talking about social media. We're talking about videos from other places. We're talking about chats, and this has to come together. And then of course, we also have this low process of getting stuff into a data warehouse, getting into the data, right? And this is not easy to do, bring all this data together. And then it gets even worse, right? The speed that's required, the speed. You wanna make a decision right away. If you're doing a credit check right now, you're not gonna wait 10 minutes, right? If someone's defrauding your ATM, you're not gonna wait five minutes. You wanna know that something is happening. And so we gotta bring all this together and we gotta do it very quickly to get to that precision decision. Now, there is a lot of change that's going on with data. We have to understand that this data, there's a lot of it, right? I'm not gonna read all the stats, you can follow along, but the most important one for me is really the last one. 70% of your mission critical data is not even in your four walls. It's coming from external sources. And we've got to grok that data. We've got to manage that data. In some cases, you've got to transform that data, secure it, and deliver it. And it is a pain. It is not easy to do, right? And so we have this insight supply chain that starts with all the upstream data sources. Everything comes in, and then we've got to bring this stuff in. We've got to figure out what is going on, right? So let's classify that data. Let's transform it so it fits in there to what we want it to do. Then we got to go augment and add different tags, add different sources, add different metadata on top of it. And then when we master it, secure that data, then we gotta figure out who to deliver it to, right? Where does it go? 
right? Is it external source? Is it active? Is it inactive? Do we take it out of the system, right? And then of course we have to figure out how to refresh that. And that cycle goes on and on every time. So once we nurture that, then we can start thinking about how we can get to the data to decisions life cycle. This is extremely important. How we take data, all types of data, structured, unstructured, semi-structured, and then when we align that to a business process, it becomes powerful. Order to cash, campaign to lead, hire to retire, incident to resolution, procure to pay. And you notice there's a line there? That line shows you what the tech team is doing. The top part is what the business side wants to do. I want to take those patterns and I want to figure out what is the insight. And I want to understand that insight. And when I understand insight, then I want to take that and I want to take action and make decisions. Sometimes making no decision is a decision. But if you look at this, it becomes a cycle. We then take that and come back over and over again. Now, we're doing these things today, in many cases, in batch. It's taking forever, right? And we got to make decisions in milliseconds. Yeah, decisions in milliseconds. And this is why decision velocity is important in getting to precision decisions. Now, one of the ways to get there is when we apply machine learning and automation. And we've got to answer that question is when do we automate things? And we've got seven tests on when automation makes sense and when you apply human powered approaches. So when things are highly repetitive, that's something you don't want to have humans do. What do we do? We get tired, we make mistakes, we get a little bit lazy, right? We get sloppy because we're doing it over and over again. We are totally bored, right? And that's where you want to apply something that's AI powered. When we think about what actually happens with lots of volume, we're overwhelmed. We can't possibly do all that on our own. And that's another area where we go to automation. And then of course, when the time to completion is quick, well, humans don't scale very well. When there's lots of interaction, humans once again get overwhelmed and confused. There's so much happening. I can probably maybe happen one, two, maybe three things at once. And that's really pushing the limits. But when you're interacting with all these devices, all these connections and have to make those decisions quickly, that's where the power of automation comes in. However, things that are complex, they cannot be modeled by math. That's where we actually see humans kind of play a role and we start to learn. We apply humans and machines and we bring them together. When things are very creative that requires to think outside of the box, well, we're humans. We make the rules and we are really good at breaking the rules. And once that's in place, we also think about fine motor skills. And that's another area where automation doesn't always do a great job. But these are important things because we have four important questions. These are the most important questions you have to answer as we enter this autonomous decade. One, when do you trust intelligent machine automation? Completely let go. Let it all happen with the machine, right? When do we augment the machine with a human? Because we want to understand the nuance. We understand why something isn't working. When do you make those exceptions? Because 99.99% accuracy in med medicine might not even be enough. We might actually have to get it down to the point it's eight nines, and that's going to be interesting in an eight sigma quality situation. And then the third question we ask is, how do we augment the human with the machine? So Humans can make quicker decisions. We can make the suggestions. We can make the recommendations. And then in what processes do you always trust human judgment? These are the questions we're going to apply to every single business process that we think about that transformation. Now, why do you want to do this? We don't do artificial intelligence and AI just for fun. We do it because we have outcomes we want to achieve. First, tell me what's going on. What is that perception? Then give me a notification. Give me an alert when something happens because that's way too much information. I can't see everything at once. So let's filter down to the important things. And then after that, help me make a recommendation. You've seen what I've done before, make a suggestion. And every time I reply to that suggestion, I have a digital feedback loop. You know why I chose something and why and where that goes. And you have the attribution. You've got context on when, where, why, you know, what process I was in, who I was with, right? And that helps us to learn. And over time, I want you to automate those recommendations. And then after a while, all that information builds on each other and we can start making predictions and forecasts and understanding what might happen. And then we get to one of the most important things you can possibly do. It is about mitigating risk. Prevention is so important. Now, let me explain. You know, when we look back, there used to be, I mean, if you imagine you have a massive recall, a massive recall. So one manufacturer had a massive recall. It was like 150 phones took out $8 billion over eight weeks. That's crazy. 
Now, if we could apply machine learning, artificial intelligence to drive down the ability to triangulate a problem, we could take it from eight weeks to one week, and that would be a billion dollar recall. To go from one week to one day would be a hundred million dollar recall. What's a million dollars to solve that problem, to save a hundred million and even eight billion dollars? And that's where you see the power of AI, really in helping you mitigate the risk figure out compliance. One fine in GDPR could cost you 3% of your revenues, not profits, your revenues. And there we start to see some of the benefits that are out there. Now, what else is happening? Well, we've got a couple things we have to do to be able to get there. We have to figure out how do we outpace the speed of business? This is important. The pace of change is happening so quickly, we need ways to catch up. We need ways to get to that automation for that transformation to occur. The other piece is we want to work faster um, but we can't do that in human scale. And how do we deliver that in human scale? It's going to take some time. And so we've got to figure out when we augment, automate and augment our manual processes. That's an important piece. We asked those four questions earlier, and the reason we have to do that is there are some processes that will never be automated that have to have a human intervention. But there's so many processes that we have to think about where we can bring that automation to achieve that data transformation. And then the other piece that's important is the scenarios that happen, they're complex. They're complex business scenarios that require some thought in terms of both the business models and the monetization models that are behind it. And then, of course, we have to figure out how to get to the next best action. How many of you remember these books? Choose Your Own Adventure, one of my favorites, right? Well, what is that next best action? How do you make that choice? How do you get there to be successful? And then, of course, one of the things that we can deliver is mass personalization at scale. That's not something we can do manually. That's something we want to be able to deliver in terms of figuring out personalization, getting the preferences, getting all the context that's required, figuring out the restrictions. Maybe you have a food allergy. You can't eat peanuts. You can't eat milk. Maybe you don't have certain types of meats that you are religiously unable to uh, eat and consume. And so we want to be able to capture that and bring that to life. And then, of course, there are other things we can do. We can do dynamic pricing and pricing optimization, taking networks and understanding demand signals, supply signals, using that to figure out are we efficiently pricing our, pricing our offerings and putting that into work. So, and then, of course, regulatory compliance is a big issue, right? Where can we actually make sure we meet what we need to do? If you're in highly regulated industries, this is very important because you don't want your best people figuring out regulatory compliance. That's an area where you want to do massive amounts of automation, massive amounts of software scale. And where you can is being preventive about that on the AI side. And then we talked about mitigating risk. If we can actually mitigate the risk of a bankruptcy, risk of a bad filing, risk of actually doing something that you know takes down billions of dollars of your company or even hundreds of dollars of your company, that's a very important piece and figuring out how to actually get that to scale. So how do we get there? How do we become successful? Well, we've got to figure out how to get to speed. Speed is so important. How do we actually make decisions quicker? There's a concept that we call decision velocity. And I've been talking about it. Decision velocity is ability to get to the faster decisions you can make, the more likely you're going to succeed and even beat the competition. I'll give you an example. Today, bots can actually operate at 100 decisions per second. Humans, at best, can respond in maybe an hour, but we have to go through the organizational structure, and that might even take a day to get to a decision. So if bots are making hundreds of decisions per second, and humans are only making a decision maybe a half day, We've got a problem. And imagine if that's your competitors that are putting automation and AI to work, you are already at least exponentially behind. So speed becomes a role. Ease of use is also super important. Our ability to actually access that information, see it, visualize it, utilize it in a way so that we've democratized that information so people can quickly make decisions. That visualization is so important because that ease of use means that I can pick it up in any device I'm using. I can actually do it in any context of a business process. And that actually helps me get to that transformation. And then, of course, we have to make sure these are industry ready and business ready. You know, the name of a customer is different when you're in healthcare because that's a patient. When you're in legal and professional services, that's a client. Right. And so when we think about the role of a customer, it's very, very different. The language is different. The industries are different. The regulations are different. Now, some value chains are similar to each other and they will collapse and we can work with each other. We can work through them. So things, comms, media, entertainment, and telco, those have converged because you're selling content. You're using different networks for distribution and the technology enables that so that you can deliver it to every customer. 
Now, contextually relevant is important. Now, you might want to know why I put this slide up here. I've always wanted to use the Easter Island slides. I have no idea why these heads are here. And that's my point on contextually relevant. Like, why? What's the location? What's the time? Where am I? Right? What business process? Am I happy? Am I feeling great? Did I have a great experience before? Contextually relevant becomes an important area of an attribute. And then, of course, we want these built with flexible architecture, the ability to actually drag and drop, the ability to use containers, the ability to use things like Kubernetes, the ability to actually you know, take microservices and bring them together. That's where it gets very exciting. And then, of course, it has to be secure. Security is such an important factor, especially given today with the DDoS attacks, the DNI attacks, all the things that are actually happening. We want to make sure that the data is secure, it's encrypted, it's able to be used. And then, of course, once we have all that together, we can start thinking about potential use cases. So let's take a look. What's going on? What are some use cases? Well, the first one is we want to be able to transform old industries with new tech. This is about thinking about brand new types of business models. I'm going to give you an example here. So how many of you actually fill out the warranty card for a toaster? Come on. Come on. Who, who, who fills out the warranty card for a toaster? Anybody? Now, usually in a room of like a thousand, maybe 5,000 people, we might get like two or three people that fill out the warranty card. Now, you don't have to answer that question, but let me explain why it's so important. Imagine the first phone call that's made to the manufacturer of that toaster. Do people ever call and say, oh, I love your toaster, it is amazing. No, they don't do that. That first phone call is a call about two things. One. My toaster is broken, can you help me fix it? Or two, I don't know how to use something. That, those are typically the problems that you get on the first call. Now, the interesting challenge is the toaster manufacturer does not know who the customer is on that phone call. It is a horrible experience because for 10 minutes, the poor, poor rep is trying to figure out, like, where did you get the toaster? What model is that toaster? When did you purchase that toaster, right? And sometimes they figure out it's not even their toaster. <laughs> so, okay, so we get this kind of situation. But think about it, that first phone call, that toaster is probably $40. That first phone call takes about 30 minutes to diagnose the problem. You're already at negative NPS and you've churned $5 of the profit or maybe even the revenue of that. And you've completely destroyed all your profit on that first phone call because your call center cost her maybe $15 an hour. That is a crazy proposition. So let me change the proposition and ask you this question. If I told you, connect that toaster to the internet. And if you do that, we will make sure we monitor the health of that toaster, protect your privacy. All you have to do is provide us maybe a text number, maybe an email, whatever you're comfortable with. And we will monitor that toaster. And if there's a defect, we'll let you know. Uh, if there is a potential problem or an upgrade that we have to tell you about, we'll let you know too. And 90 days before that toaster is gonna die, we will give you a warning. Would you take that offer now? Would you like register your toaster? Now, if you said yes, Thank you, because now I can actually do a bunch of things. I can actually create a whole bunch of opportunities with that toaster because I can say, hey, I'm remote monitoring your toaster and there's something bad that's about to happen. You know, would you like to buy a new toaster? And you might take the offer and I might even give you the offer for the same price you paid for 10 years ago. That's a pretty cool offer, right? And I might even do something different. I might actually say, look, would you be interested in getting this toaster for 15 cents a month for the next eight years? We'll give you a brand new toaster. Oh, you're thinking, hey, what is that? Well, that's called toast as a service. Why wouldn't you do that? And pretty soon I can get to some interesting things. If you say yes on the toaster, I might make you an offer on other kitchen appliances and say, look, I will do your entire kitchen for $100 a month. And if any product ever dies or fails, we'll get you a brand new one. We will make sure we monitor the health of those products. We'll make sure that all the safety is there. And that's all you have to pay, $100 a month, right? What have we done? We've created five different business models built on data. And this is the digital transformation we're talking about. The first one, we're doing customer experience monitoring. We're making sure that the product's okay. We want to know what's going on. Now, I got a very interesting question for you. Why do bagels cost a lot of problems and toasters, right? And that's really what I really wanted to ask you. Why do they do, why does that happen? Why do bagels cost problems? And so we can actually see some very interesting regional, regional statistics. You will see that maybe in New York, the bagels are actually causing more problems than perhaps in London right, where you don't see a lot of bagels. And that's the type of thing that we're starting to do. And then that customer experience monitoring, we're trying to figure out, hey, what are the most common problems that are occurring, right? Why do toasters break more in Houston, Texas than in Dubai? Think about it. What could it be? What could it be? Humidity, 
right? And something we can actually do, customer experience monitoring, track down problems, understand what customers are experiencing, and actually improve our products. The second thing is we can do remote field service. Anything that's kind of broken, remote diagnostics, we can fix them ahead of time so that you don't have to send someone out there and you can actually keep people in a warranty plan. The third piece, we suddenly have a services model. Toast as a service. Think about it. For 15 cents a month, for the next eight years, we will take care of your toaster. It's a great deal. And we'll get you a replacement. If anything breaks, we'll take care of that. And then of course, we have the ability to go direct to consumer. That means the toaster manufacturer who traditionally sell to re retailer can now go to direct. They can actually offer something to them. And then of course, the cross sell. We'll do your entire kitchen. Five business models off of data and that's just a toaster. That could be an appliance. That could be your car. That could be any manufactured good where you're actually providing these capabilities. This is the power of the transformation we're talking about. The second piece, we've got to rethink and invent brand new types of business models. And these could actually be in a different form. And let's take the same vein. Let me make you an offer here. For $15 a month, I'm going to give you an 85-inch screen TV for seven years and a free upgrade. Would you take that? Would you take that deal? Now you're like, wait, what's the catch? What's going to happen? Like, why, why did I do that? Well, you know, it's actually a really good deal. You're spending less than $1,000 and you get a free upgrade for an awesome brand new TV. And if you were to say yes, well, what would the business be? The manufacturer of that TV or someone else in a warranty plan could provide a very cool offer. They would go and figure out, hey, what products are better? Which one has a tread or track record? They would take data from a company like Best Buy and say, hey, which one breaks more? Who's got a better track record? And then... Pretty soon, they would be able to make an offer to you like what we did. And every manufacturer can go direct to consumer or a new player could emerge that says, I'll take care of everyone's TVs. And if they did that, they would have a brand new type of business model. The manufacturers suddenly have more information about which components break more, which features are being used, why are those features being used? And of course, what it does, it allows you the ability to think about how to actually take all your broken defect and actually apply that to reinsurance. And so suddenly the manufacturer is the insurer. The manufacturer is now insuring and they've got the capability to keep these units in there. And if you did this for the next three to five years, well, you would actually dominate a market and you'd be able to actually say, look, I'm going to guarantee you a TV. It doesn't matter what the brand is. It's good for 85 inches and we'll take care of you for $15 a month for seven years. For seven years, you will lock every customer down. That's a pretty good thing. And you can start offering other things back to the kitchen. And maybe I'll do your HVAC unit. I'll do your air conditioning and heating for you. So that's one option. Now, the other thing is we are building what we call data-driven digital networks. These data-driven digital networks are happening everywhere. And it's about going across different value chains. It's about converging industry value chains and actually getting something interesting. So manufacturing, retail, and distribution could be one chain, right? Healthcare, insurance, right? And public sector could be one chain. And we're seeing that collapsing in different industries. So what do we need to do to get started? Well, it's very exciting, right? You know, first of all, we got to start with answering the business question. Ask questions that you don't have an answer to, right? Normally you would ask a question to say, yeah, you know, how is the number of marketing leads, what's coming in, or how's our performance in terms of revenue, you know, per unit sale? Okay, great. That's interesting. But when you start asking questions outside of departments, it gets a little tricky. You're like, oh, but I don't have the data. Well, that's the point. You want to be able to ask the right business question. Do I bring in 10 more FTEs in marketing or do I spend a million dollars on a campaign? Right? It's a very valid question. But Ray, I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know how to get there. Uh, well, that's okay. Ask the question first and then let's go figure out where to find the data sources. Once we understand where the data sources are, we now have the opportunity to then do something different. We can then bring that information together, help visualize it differently. Look at this chart right here. This heat map, I wanna know why those areas are brown, don't you? Or what's deep blue versus what's light blue? And what you're trying to do is help people ask the right questions, understand how to use the data, understand how those questions result in how you actually organize that data and what do you search for and bring together. Then what we wanna do is connect it to the right people. Right? We know the questions, we know the flow and the process, we are building data proficiency. Then, well, we've got to go out and connect it to the right people so that they can make the right decisions and they surface up those decisions at the right time. And once that's in place, it's got to look cool, right? You've got to get awesome visualization. You've got to be able to see what's going on. And when you have that in place, then you understand, oh, okay, 
Now I can actually use that data, peak and put that use to be successful. Okay, so we talked about all this. We also have to think about the ethical use of that data and of course in AI. And we've got five rules to get you there, right? Those five rules are important. The first one, it's gotta be transparent. You gotta be see what's going on, right? You gotta understand the algorithms, you gotta understand why those algorithms are there, right? And then, you know, you've gotta figure out if there are biases, you gotta be able to explain them. Now, biases aren't a bad thing. If you're deliberately discriminating against, you know, left-handers with purple hair or not deliberately, and you found that you've done that, we've got a problem, right? So, but if the bias is there because you're selecting for certain things and certain characteristics that are really important, like for example, you might to have to have military training to be able to get into a secure location. Uh, you might to have to have a certain skill in math. Maybe you have to have a certain skill in communications to be able to get a job. Totally makes sense, but you gotta be able to explain it. And once you can explain it, Right? If there's a problem like bias, which we talked about, we gotta be able to reverse it, unlearn something that's wrong. And then of course, once that's in place, we gotta be able to train these systems. These systems take years. I told you this earlier, right? Imagine 90% accuracy in manufacturing. That's not a problem. That's probably okay, right? But we gotta figure out what the exceptions are. 90% accuracy in healthcare? No way. 90% accuracy in autonomous driving? No way. When there's lives involved, we're expecting higher degrees of quality and precision. And then once that's in place, we always have this fear like, oh my God, the machines are taking over. They're gonna come attack us. All right, well, if you're afraid of that, you start every process with a human and you end the process with a human as a check. All right, so now you got it. Five simple rules. These are design principles for AI ethics, something you wanna make sure you apply as we're talking about it. Okay, so we talked a lot. 61% of the Fortune 500 merged, acquired, gone bankrupt since 2000. Massive amounts of change are in place. We have to think about how we get started. The first part is we're building new experiences and outcomes in this transformation. So think about what that is. Apply design thinking, apply level empathy, start with that, put yourself in the customer's shoes. And then we got to figure out how we actually build a culture of digital. What's that digital DNA? Let's make sure folks can bring right brain, left brain activities together. They've got the data proficiency to be successful. And then when we have that in place, form always follows function, All right? Form follows function. Get the business model right and the monetization model right first. And then we can figure out which cool technologies to apply, right? Of course, we gotta start in the cloud. Of course, there's gonna be machine learning and AI. And then maybe on the edge, there's IoT and something else. Right? Maybe we're using computer vision and augmented reality and virtual reality and putting that all together, right? And of course, form follows function. Now, once we have that in place, we've gotta shift from gut-driven to data-driven decisions. We're using data to advance forward. We're figuring out what products work and figure out why something happens. And we gotta have that data in place. And once we have that data in place, we can start figuring out how to build the patterns, how to automate, and then of course, applying the AI there. And then of course, this isn't easy. If this was easy, you could just buy in a package and be done. And so a lot of this transformation requires you to co-innovate and co-create with partners. Remember, we can't do it alone. You want to co-innovate and co-create with partners. And if you put all this in place, we're ready. We're ready to do this data-driven transformation that's out there for you. So thank you very much. If you've got any questions, please feel free. Reach out to me. Happy to help you. Have a great event.